Good morning. I would like to start this service by remembering our baptisms. <laughs> Feel God's cool spirit wash over you. Larry Marge, you can't escape. <laughs> God's cleansing power. <laughs> Hopefully the camera still works after this. But it is great to see everybody. We got a more recent rain this time, but... Boy, is it nice right now with a nice cool breeze. So we will keep riding this good weather as long as we'll take it. And so the only change coming up that I know is that starting on the Sunday after Labor Day, we will be returning to 1030 service. Some of you are rejoicing and some of you are mildly disappointed, but that is what is happening. So, But it is great to see everybody here. And before we begin, I first want to thank everybody who uh, helped out with the uh, children's service uh, last Sunday. I thought it really went well. Uh, and I really want to thank uh, Ken Mann especially for uh, putting together his lesson. I learned quite a bit there. Uh, just, just teach the kids not to play with household chemicals too much. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I want to thank uh, Kim Hart and the Milton Presbyterian Women for donating all of the school supplies, and I want to thank Andrea for helping uh, prepare all the gifts and uh, continually uh, pouring so much into the children's ministry, uh, as well as our teachers, uh, Cindy Mann and uh, Tammy Wilson and uh, Angel Mackey, and they have all uh, really put a lot into the kids' program, so I want to thank you first. Now, moving on, we have the other announcements that we have. I want to open it up right now. Uh, to, to everyone else to see if you have anything, any announcements that you wish to share at this time before we begin worship. Yes, Portia. Um, it's not an announcement. It's a joy I experienced on the way to, to church today. Uh, Wadsworth has a lot of those little food cupboards. And as I passed one today, there was a family there that was restocking it. And it was just nice to know that people still care about strangers and those who are hurting at this point in time. Good. I agree. We need to see more generosity and celebrate it as well so that light can shine uh, throughout everywhere to illuminate the truth and the goodness. Any other announcements that anyone wishes to make? Uh, seeing none, I want to begin with our call to worship. Now, uh, later in the service, we will leave time for specific prayer requests, but as we open our service... I want to uh, open with these words from John 15, verses 1 to 4, and then we will have a moment uh, for meditation uh, so that we, we can be cleansed and clear our minds of any distractions, any guilt, anything weighing heavily on our heart uh, so that we can put it on God, so God can take those burdens and we can concentrate on the Lord during this hour fully. This is, these are the words from John 15, verses 1 to 4. I have uh, quoted parts of this section of Scripture a few times over these uh, past few months, and so I hope it's familiar, but it is good to repeat the truth. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit uh, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You already are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Thanks be to God. And of course, it's important to know that these are the words Jesus spoke to his disciples. And so as we hear them now, we also hear them as disciples of Jesus. And <clears throat> there's a lot to say about uh, bearing fruit, but first I want us to... Take a moment, quiet our hearts, and give those times to God where we might not have remained in the Lord over this past week, and the ways we might have stumbled, 
uh, the hurtful things we may have uh, said to one another without realizing it, or the ways our heart has felt heavy. And so I want us to take a moment in prayer to lift those up. Please pray with me. Lord, we have not always remained in you. We believe that we can go out on our own without your help sometimes. We, are, we at times think we have to be self-sufficient. Sometimes we hold our own opinions as facts, and we are pained at first when unfruitful parts of our lives are pruned. We are hurt even more when we have to let go of those parts of our lives that have been fruitful, and you prune those too. Lord, envelop us with your changing nature. Transform us and cleanse our souls as we lift up those ways we have stumbled and those ways we may have sinned over the past week, year, and beyond. Amen. Now for our assurance of pardon this week, we know that we are forgiven based on Christ's action upon the cross of him giving his life. But I want to specifically lift up a, another part of Scripture. This one from Hosea, chapter 14, verses 1 to 9. When God forgives Israel of their transgressions. And the beauty of this passage has to do with the richness of its imagery in the natural world. Listen closely to God's amazing grace. Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously, that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made. For in you the fatherless find compassion. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. Like a cedar of Lebanon, he will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. People will dwell again in his shade. They will flourish like the grain. They will blossom like the vine. Israel's fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I am like a flourishing juniper. Your fruitfulness comes from me. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Thank, Thank you to God. And to respond to this, knowing that we are in God's graces, as long as we truly believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and that we believe we are forgiven and that we are repentant and constantly seek the heart of God. I will sing now the first and last verses of hymn 590, I am his and he is mine.
So, I remember when we were talking about uh, gardening in my sermon, we talked a little bit about pruning, and that's where we visited this passage from John. And I mentioned, and lots of gardeners know, it is very important to prune your uh, bushes and your trees and your plants to keep them flowering, to keep them fruitful. And there's a lot to that when Jesus said, my father is the gardener and he will prune the vine. Not just those parts of the vine that do not bear fruit, but also those parts that already have borne fruit so that a new shoot can come up and produce another fruit. Uh, and of course, without a good root, you can't bear fruit. Now you can, uh, you can use that a few times because uh, it sounds good. And, uh, but first, I want to talk and focus on the image of the fruit itself uh, because it comes up a number of times in Scripture. Now I am going to uh, take a break from the microphone and I will carry these fruits to the kids. Now, I was originally going to cut these open to show the seeds inside, but I didn't want to get my shirt on that. <laughs> well, look, I have a fruit for each one of them. All right, which fruit? You got which fruit do you want? This one? All right. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm going to leave you with the fruit, and I'm going to talk about the fruit from up here a little bit so everyone can hear. Now, Gus has a summer squash, and it's commonly known as a vegetable because it's good, so if you say eat your vegetables, that's a good thing, but it's actually a fruit. Not to confuse you too much. But to talk about the uh, fruit and why it's important to know why a summer squash is a fruit, why is a summer squash a fruit and not a vegetable? Because it tastes delicious? <laughs> it's got seeds. It's got seeds. That's right. That is a really important part about fruit. When Jesus tells us to bear fruit, he is referring to those seeds. What does a seed do? Nothing. Does it taste good? <laughs> depends. It depends, right. <laughs> the sunflower seeds taste pretty good. What does does anyone know what what why is a seed important? Now the kids are looking at the fruit, so I'll just <laughs> I'll just say. Uh, the seed is important because it can turn into a whole new plant that can produce not just one fruit, but many fruits. Okay? Now, how many seeds do these fruits have in them? It depends. It depends. So the peach has a seed. Uh, the orange has a fair amount of seeds. And the summer squash has a lot of seeds. And so all those seeds produce a plant that also produces many fruits. And each one of those fruits can fall down to the ground and give the seeds back to the ground. And those can grow into even more fruits. So the importance of a fruit is that it can reproduce. One fruit can produce many, many, many fruits. Okay, that's the importance of seeds. What else can a fruit do? What, what else, why else is a fruit important? Oh, come on, this is the easiest one. What, can you, what do you appreciate most about fruits? I like to eat it. Yes, you can eat them. Thank you, Dolores. <laughs> fruits are delicious. And uh, they're a good source of sugars, give you the energy, but healthy sugars, not like candy. What? Stay away from candy, kids. Um, but that's, that's really important, is that they're sweet. They taste good, and they help keep us alive. 
Now that is the importance of fruit. And now back to the seeds of multiplying, sometimes you'll hear, be fruitful. One of God's commands to people is be fruitful and multiply. And that, that shows that one person can, or two people, really, you need two people, two people can start a family and grow from there. And so Jesus uses this imagery of the fruit because fruits are pleasing to the eye, to the taste, to the stomach. And also, they can produce, they can reproduce. One fruit can become many, many different fruits. And so, there's that idea of growth in the fruit. And so, that is really the importance of the imagery of the fruit. Will you please join me in prayer uh, to thank Jesus for this image and for fruit. Lord, thank you so much for giving us all of your teaching. And Lord, thank you for giving us the image of fruit so that we can reproduce your love, that it can grow and spread on its own. And Lord, thank you for giving us such an abundance to eat and to nourish our bodies so we can grow to be healthy and strong and follow your ways. Amen. Now, that is essentially the basis of, of why fruit uh, is so important. But this morning we are going to talk about and focus on the urgency to bear fruit. Not necessarily the urgency to, bear, to be fruitful and multiply on that level. You, you can take some time there, kids. But the urgency to bear spiritual fruit. Uh, that gives life to everyone around you. And it's a message that is found throughout the New Testament. But I want to start today with uh, the Old Testament with an illustration about the importance of fruit trees to sustaining a community in a city. In Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book of the Bible, it gives a recap of uh, the Israelites' story, at the beginnings of their story, and how they came to be a one people, 12 tribes, uh, but one people. Uh, and that the basis of their story was also the law that God wanted them to follow. God set out regulations and guidance for how they were to live. And he also even gave them guidance in conducting war against their enemies. And this is an important part of that law. It's a somewhat obscure part, but it is important to know the importance of fruit, uh, fruit trees. This is from Deut Deuteronomy 20, verses 19 to 20. When you lay, lay siege to a city for a long time, fighting against it to capture it, do not destroy its trees by putting an axe to them, because you can eat their fruit. Do not cut them down. Are these trees like the people so you can besiege them? However, you may cut down trees that are not fruit trees and use them to build siege works until the city at war with you falls. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. And so you see that even when they are trying to capture cities, one of the most valuable things there are the trees that bear fruit. Of course, we know some trees bear fruit and some trees do not. The fruit trees were extremely important for the community because food was not as abundant. And so you needed these groves to sustain large amounts of people to keep your armies strong, to keep uh, the, your family strong, your kids growing. And it is a very practical example of the, important, uh, the importance of certain types of uh, trees. Some were good just for their structural capacity for building, but others were good at, at sustaining life, at giving life. And these fruitful trees held the most value. I also want to point out that uh, bearing spiritual fruit is important, is a common t theme in the New Testament. Um, I don't know if uh, any of you, any of the kids or any, any of the teachers remember the importance of the fruits of the Spirit. We've gone over this a few times. Uh, who can remember all the fruits of the Spirit? Oh, come on. There's a good, there's a good song to uh, remember it by. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I switch gentleness and faithfulness out around sometimes, so bear with me there. And uh, I only remembered about half of them in Spanish, so I'm not going to try that. But we did work with the kids in Ecuador to talk about the fruits of the Spirit. Again, those are part of the, the fruit that comes from your lips that uh, Hosea was talking about. And uh, this is the fruit that comes from the Holy Spirit. But even before we bear this fruit, we are called to first bear fruit in keeping with repentance. This is how we are to prepare for the Lord to enter our hearts. And this is exactly the same wording that John the Baptist uses to prepare the people for the coming of Christ at the very beginning of Luke's Gospel. After the Christmas narrative, the scene shifts to Jesus, or to John, sorry, John baptizing the people in the wilderness. And John is, is a, a bit of a, a free spirit, so to speak, even though he is a very disciplined free spirit. So it's a, it is it's an interesting combination. And John, when he preaches, he doesn't really pull any punches. So this is how, listen to how he opens, but then he gets very specific about his teaching. And this is part of the beauty of, of John's very short sermon that he is giving to these people who are being prepared to be baptized for the coming of the Lord. He was in the wilderness uh, baptizing repentance and forgiveness. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is ready at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. <clears throat> Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Do not collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. This is a holy uh, wisdom and a holy word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And the beauty of John's preaching is that it was very specific. If people had, people had a very specific question, how do we produce fruit in keeping with repentance? And John tells them, there are very simple moral things that you can do to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. But the most important part of these things that he is instructing them to do are things that sort of go against what might be the grain of their culture. Uh, you know, first, normal people, they say, if you have more than enough to sustain yourself, you should simply share with the one who does not have enough to sustain themselves. And don't try to rationalize your way out of it. Don't try to say they've put themselves in that position. I have earned what I've had. This is, this is where I am for a reason. It's very easy to rationalize your way out of it with the culture around you and get support with that. John cuts to the point. Ah, but then what about the tax collectors, another group that was somewhat demonized? or they, uh, they were no good, and why were they no good? Because they collected more than they should. Why did they do that? Because they could learn, earn a little extra on the side. And this was probably something that was quite common in the tax collector culture. They were despised and hated, and it was a very difficult position to be in because nobody liked the guy taking your money for no good reason, or at least in your mind because you were occupied at the time by Rome. And so they were colluding with the enemy. And so I'm sure they would feel, 
well, if I have to be ostracized and put down and excluded from the community, I deserve a little extra because this is a burden that weighs on my heart. But that does not produce fruit in keeping with repentance. These are very specific actions. And then soldiers. Soldiers can do similar things to tax collectors. Soldiers, again, work for the occupiers. They can extort people. They can bully people into giving them money. They can accuse people falsely if they don't get their pay. But again, that does not keep fruit in that does not produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And so even though their own group might say these things are okay, it's a part of life, it's a cost of doing business, John says, cut it out. This is what produces fruit that will give life and that will produce the love that is to come. And so that just lays the groundwork for Jesus who is coming. Okay? And of course, John says Jesus is coming to baptize you not with water for just forgiveness, forgiveness of your sins. So I'm glad that you got a little sprinkled this morning because it sets the stage. But Jesus is coming to baptize you with the Holy Spirit to convict you, to inflame you. So that you can feel energized. So you can be broken down to who you are in God and in Christ to do that mission. So John knows that there is an urgency here, though, to repent. Because otherwise it is going to be hard to receive the message of Christ. Because your mind is going to be stuck in rationalizing what the world wants you to think. Ah, but the, the urgency doesn't stop there. See, Jesus doesn't just preach in a way that says... You're okay. If you're keeping those fruits, you are doing fine. Jesus wants people to go further, and Jesus pushes an even further urgency for people to produce fruit, both of repentance and the fruits of the Spirit that we talked about earlier in Paul. And so Jesus gives a parable about this, but he sets up this parable with a very real-life story and a response. Again, Part of this message is to show how different methods and styles of teaching are so important. John taught directly and specified direct situations. Here, Jesus brings up a situation uh, that people would know from in their own news in the community. And this is uh, from Luke 13, verses 1 to 5. And I'll relate this story, and then I'll explain a little bit about where the story is coming from. This is Luke 13, 1 to 5. Now there were some present at that time who Jesus, uh, who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because, because they suffered in that way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too all will perish. This is holy wisdom and a holy word. Thank you, God. So we all understand those words, unless you repent, you too all will perish. I don't think we know about what he is talking about, or the, the Galileans whose, whose blood Pilate mixed with their sacrifices, or that incident when the tower fell on 18 people and killed them in Siloam. We don't have, have context for these events. They aren't even in Scripture. Because they were contemporary. They were things that you found in the news. They were things that they could relate to. They were things that we still find in the news. And they represent two different types of misfortune and evil. So the first, when Pilate mixed the blood, uh, so Pilate had mixed the, the Galileans' blood with their sacrifices. This is a sort of a euphemistic term, or it's a term that, that glosses over the fact that Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the uh, Roman procurator, probably, in a very vicious way, uh, sent the Galileans a message, and he killed them while they were in worship. Okay, These are events that still happen today. And they come up in the news as great tragedies. This is an example of moral evil that comes from mankind. 
Okay, the second example is an example of chance, of what, what theologians term natural evil. And that is when the tower in Siloam fell on 18 people and killed them. And so the question that Jesus proposes is, do they deserve that punishment? Did they do something to sin? Any worse than what the sort of sinner that you are? That is what he's telling to the people. And he says, I tell you no. If you don't repent, you will all perish. Because people would love to rationalize why this happened to some people, but not others. Well, they made some mistakes in their life. And they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, but if God knows everything that's going to happen, they were meant to be there. And people rationalize that so they feel like they can have a little more control over their faith. Or their, their fate. And, and faith, honestly. But he, listen to this. This is the parable that Jesus tells right after he offers this illustration. This is Luke 13, 6-9. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three now, years now I have been coming back to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up this soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit the next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. This is the holy wisdom and the holy word. Thank you, God. And Jesus responds to this story about questioning why bad things happen to people by telling everyone to repent and that there is an urgency to it because everyone was in the wrong at that time. And his solution was what? It was to tell people to follow him. And this is an amazing passage because it, it shows the tension between urgency and grace and mercy. Uh, Fred Craddock, who was a, a, a longtime preacher, and he wrote, uh, he was a Presbyterian uh, preacher, and he wrote an interpretation commentary on Luke, and he puts it, really well when, when he writes about this passage. He says that God is the judge of our behavior, and yet God offers us all the opportunity for repentance. Attending to one's relation to God is a matter of most urgent business now, and yet God is patient with a fig tree that does not bear fruit. Luke does not destroy the severity by infusing grace, nor does he destroy grace by infusing severity. See, Luke knows that any mixing of severity and grace or any attempt to average them will result in that which is neither severity or grace. To know God, you need to know both of those things fully. Now, giving it one more year, see, the Jesus actually doubles down on this image in another instance. And, you know, fruit usually only comes when it is in season. We all know that. It is peach season. I hope we're taking advantage of that. Uh, and it's hard to get uh, peaches that are not in season, certainly not locally. And in the middle of winter, it's uh, almost impossible. Um, but one thing that, that Jesus preaches constantly, again, in this New Testament, is not to wait to bear fruit. And uh, this final story, this final illustration is uh, from Mark's gospel this time. And uh, this is from Mark 11, verses 12 to 14. Uh, and then we'll go to, uh, to 25 and listen to this, how it sets it up. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. This is an important part of the story. The fact that Jesus was hungry. Uh, why was it an important part? Does being hungry ever affect anyone's mood at all? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Me too. So keep in mind, you know, one of, one of the few times Jesus gets upset, we'll, we'll see it, and now we know a little bit why. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went out to find if it had any fruit. 
When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not in season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. <laughs> you know what happened? Right after this, this hat, when he, when he told this fig tree not to eat any figs from it again. It's a pretty funny moment, honestly. Jesus went to the temple, saw people sac you know, selling animals to sacrifice, and he saw people exploiting prayer and God's power by making money off of this prayer. This still happens today. What did Jesus do when he saw those people selling sacrifices and exchanging coin from different lands? What did he do? Yeah, he started flipping out, literally. He was flipping tables over. Now, Jesus doesn't lose control. He did this for a very pointed message. But it does help to know that Jesus was probably hungry when he was doing that. Okay? <laughs> Jesus does not get upset very often to that degree. Now, in the morning they went along. This is Mark 11, 20 to 25, after that story. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes that they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Thanks be to God. Jesus combines all of these things to show his lesson. Don't wait for the right season to bear fruit in keeping of repentance and bear the fruit that God wants you to bear. Act in accordance with the ways God wants you to act. And this image of the fig tree is not to glorify cursing or the power in prayer that uh, to destroy. Because right after that, he follows up with one of the most important things that we as Christians have to remember all the time. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. This sort of urgency is not something we can take for granted. God's incredible mercy and grace is not something that we can take for granted. Even though to God, He, honestly, I think one of the reasons it's taken so long for Jesus to return is because God wants to continue to give grace. But we as Christians cannot keep waiting to bear that fruit. We have to do so today. But preach that and live that same love and mercy and repentance. Amen. Before we go into prayer, I want us to sing together hymn number 421, uh, the first and last lines. Lord, I want to be a Christian.
join me in prayer as we lift up those closest to us who are in need of, of such prayer. And we give thanks to God for what we have. And we will finish the Lord's Prayer. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you so much for your incredible mercy and grace that you have shown us. Lord, thank you for the opportunities that you give us to right the wrongs, to enact both love and justice. And Lord, thank you for blessing us with your fruit that comes from your Holy Spirit. And Lord, now we lift up those who are in need of your presence the most and those whom we are thankful for, both silently and, and out loud at this time. For Gemma, Todd, and Abby, Chuck, Timmy, and his family. Bill and Judy Beale. Lord, hold all of these people close to your heart. Infuse them with your spirit. Give them that urgency from your spirit and also that same peace and rest. And Lord, we pray now together these words your Son taught us to pray, praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our sins as we forgive those that are debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out. Do not wait to bear good fruit. And remember God's urgent call to follow Christ. To follow in his footsteps. And to love not just one another, but even the strangest of the strangers and your enemies. Amen.